In 1928, David Hilbert, one of the most influential mathematicians of his time, asked whether it is possible to create an algorithm that could determine the correctness of a mathematical statement. This was called the decision problem, or Entscheidungsproblem, in Hilbert's native German. In 1936, both Alan Turing and Alonzo Church independently reached the conclusion that the answer is no. The way Turing did it was to imagine a universal machine, a machine that could compute anything that could be computed. This idea, the Turing machine, laid the foundations for the device you're using to watch this video. By the end of this video, you will have learned what a Turing machine is, what can and cannot be computed, what it means to be Turing complete and how modern computers relate to Turing machines. So what is a Turing machine? You might expect a universal machine to be a complex device. Nothing could be further from the truth. A machine has just four parts and the language used to program it has just five instructions. The parts are a tape, a head, a program and a state. What you're seeing here is a program that executes P0 to print 0 to the tape, moves the head right with the R instruction and then jumps back to the start. It will go on printing zeros forever. Notice that state and the value never change. Every time the machine performs a jump, the current state and value are used to pick the correct next row of instructions to execute. This program only has a single state, start, and every time it jumps, the symbol under the head is blank. Let's take a look at a program with multiple states. This program prints alternating zeros and ones to the tape. It has two states, 0 and 1, to illustrate what happens when you jump to a different state. You can also achieve the same result by using a single state and alternating the value. The value column always stays up to date with what the current symbol is under the head. Then when we jump, that value is used to know which row of instructions to execute. Combining state and value gives us a surprising amount of control over what our program does. We've so far seen three instructions. E prints a given symbol to the tape. R moves the tape head right and jump jumps to a given state. But there are two more. L moves the tape head left and H halts the machine. This program prints the word Allen from right to left, then halts. Everything you have ever seen a computer do can be done with a Turing machine. We'll see a glimpse of how it can work in practice a little later. The last example I want to show you before we move on is the very first program Alan Turing showed the world. It's the first program featured in his 1936 paper on computable numbers with an application to the Entscheidungsproblem. Turing liked to leave spaces between symbols, going as far as to even define them as f squares and e squares, f for figure and e for erasable. His algorithms would often make use of E squares to help the machine remember the location of specific tape squares. But what does it mean to compute? Something is said to be computable if there exists an algorithm that can get from the given input to the expected output. Adding together two integers is computable. Here I am giving the machine a tape that starts out with the values 2 and 6 in binary separated by a blank. This program adds the two numbers together arriving at the answer 8. It does this by decrementing from the right number and incrementing the left number until the right number is 0. You may have wondered why I'm choosing to work with binary numbers rather than decimal. It's not just because it's how modern computers work. I'm going to show you two examples and from those examples you'll be able to see why modern computers choose to work in binary. The first example is a program that increments a binary number in an endless loop. The second example is a program that increments a decimal number in an endless loop. These two programs are doing the same thing, but the program for manipulating decimal numbers is much longer. We've even introduced some new syntax, the asterisk symbol, to handle a value under the head that does not match any of the other values for that state. It's for this reason when programming Turing machines, we prefer binary numbers. The programs end up being shorter and easier to reason about. But what can't be computed? To approach this question, we need to explain the halting problem. It goes like this. Given a program and some input, is it possible to write a second program that will tell you with certainty whether the first program will halt or run forever? 
The answer is no. And this is what Turing essentially proved. So imagine you write a program that takes as its input the program being used to decide whether it will halt or not. What it then does is run the decider program on itself and then do the opposite of what the decider program says. This program intentionally enters an infinite loop if it is told it will halt and halts if it is told it will run forever. It seems like a silly example, but it is a legitimate counterexample to the idea that the halting problem can be solved. So what does it mean to be Turing complete? A system is Turing complete if it can be used to simulate a Turing machine. I've made this video with the Turing machine simulations in JavaScript. Therefore, JavaScript is Turing complete. But wouldn't you need an infinite amount of memory to simulate a Turing machine? Doesn't the tape extend forever in both directions? Yes, you're right, and everyone tends to cheat a bit with the definition. When someone says something is Turing complete, what they mean is it would be Turing complete if it had an infinite amount of memory. And how does this all relate to modern computers? A key difference between our Turing machine and the device you're watching this on is that your device's CPU has registers. You can think of registers as the variables for your CPU, but they can only store fixed size numbers. We can create registers in our Turing machine. Here we define three registers, A, B and C. Each register contains a three bits and can store numbers between zero and seven. Then at the far left we have an H, which stands for home, which will help us navigate. To increment register C, we can write a program like this. Now we're making a lot more liberal use of the asterisk symbol here to help us navigate to specific parts of the tape without having to enumerate all possible values that could be under the head on the way there. This program is effectively equivalent to the following x86 assembly code if x86 had a register named C. If we wanted to add a values in A and B, storing the result in C, we need to do more work. I will warn you that the program is long and complex, and I don't expect you to understand it in full. Its main purpose is to show you that we can implement operations seen in modern assembly code on a Turing machine. This is painfully laborious, and it doesn't even precisely match the assembly code. It destroys the values in A and B as it adds them together, and it doesn't handle overflow. But it's a start, and I hope it gives you a glimpse of how the theoretical machine can be built up to operate like a modern CPU.